All good? Good morning, or is it evening for you? I know we should be celebrating in Liverpool. However, circumstances dictate differently. ISBS is to be congratulated for organizing a series of presentations as the conference had to be canceled. My name is Emeritus Professor Bruce Elliott, and it is an honor and a pleasure to chair this Dyson lecture. Interestingly, I was the president of ISBS in 2003 when that year's conference had to be canceled because of the SARS virus. Yeah. I acknowledge Jeffrey Dyson, the man many consider the father of sports biomechanics. And it is name that graces the most prestigious award presented at each ISBS conference. This year's recipient is Professor David Lloyd. I have admired David's lateral thinking that has led to pioneering research for many years. And I feel fortunate our paths crossed when I was able to lure him back to UWA from the US. He has certainly played a significant role in developing biomechanics in Australia and worldwide. He always creates a strong theoretical base and it's from this theoretical base that functional applications typically flow. He's a world leader in such areas as computer simulation and musculoskeletal modeling. And certainly he's a pioneer and responsible for so much of the early ACL and continuing ACL research throughout the world. If you have any questions with reference to David, David's lecture, Go to live chat in YouTube and you can present those questions during or in actual fact after, immediately that is, after his presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce a truly worthy recipient of this Dyson Award. I give you Professor David Lloyd from Griffith University. Thanks, Bruce, for that very... I'm not sure it's really you me you're talking about or some other bloke. Um, I'm just this bloke from the Shire in, in Sydney, which is quite amazing when you think about the, the travels I've been on. Um, and I, was, I must admit, I was very surprised to actually be given this award. Uh, I was asked whether I'd be up for it a couple of years ago, and I thought, oh, yeah, okay. And then I think it was a year ago, or a year, someone said, oh, you got it. And I'm going, oh, huh. Completely surprised. So I really am very humbled to um, receive it. Um, a lot of this work is really about the teams that we've developed. And through this lecture, I hopefully will cover some of the, the people have helped me along the way in, in this venture that we've, it's quite a while ago now, it's um, early 90s, and it's been a, a long and fruitful journey. I am not I'm going to look at the past and what we've done, but I'm really more interested in the future. And as you can see, the title of today's slide is The Future of Infield Sports Biomechanics. And you'll see a subtitle there, Wearing Wearables Plus Modeling Compute Real-Time In Vivo Tissue Loading to Prevent and Repair Musculoskeletal Tissues. Now, I'm, I present that because that met those combinations and methods are upon us right now. And I believe in-field sports biomechanics, where we look at in vivo tissue loading in real time, is not very far into the future. And I think these will be the tools of what the future will bring as sports biomechanists. Um, now I'm going to focus on the main topics I've been involved with over a long period of time. One is anterior cruciate ligament injury and reconstruction. And, and of late, I've delved into Achilles tendinopathy. Um, I bring in Achilles tendinopathy because that's probably the most full representation of our, our future vision. But I'll also um, give you an idea about where we've come from 
and why we're now at this tissue level um, loading in real time in the real world. So let's venture into it. Now, as Bruce said, I usually like to um, mount all my things on a, a strong theoretical basis. And a lot of musculoskeletal conditions and sports medicine problems, they are a multi-scale problem. And at the moment, we have a lot of molecular biochemistry, cellular biochemistry, biology, all the omics, we have animal models. On the other side of the size spectrum, we have epidemiology and large prospective cohort studies, randomized controlled trials. And in the middle, which is where a lot of biomechanists actually operate, is in the human-based studies like human biomechanics, human pain pathways, human neurophysiology. Now, we're trying to join those different corners of the triangle using biostatistics. And I've spoken a lot about this um, in, in the literature and also in, in many of my talks, is that we use biostatistics, but it's an ill-formed mathematical method to actually join these things together. What we have now at our disposal is computational biomedicine and simulation. That's actually bread and butter for the biomechanics community. But now we're also delving into data science and artificial intelligence. So what you have here is you still have statistics and we don't need to throw that out at all because it can be used still. But we have these physics or physical based models and data models. What I propose and what we've been proposing recently that you unite all these things together to actually understand this multi-scale problem of musculoskeletal conditions. Again, it needs a theoretical framework and we've been working on this a while as well. So the management of musculoskeletal systems is inherently neuro because we have a neuro, neural system which controls our movement. And we have a, a sensory, we have the motor intention of the person. And then we have a sensory motor supraspinal loop. Basically, you have mechanoreceptors in the joints and in the skin and, the, and other places around the body, which measure movement. The movement is the biomechanics, and that's driven by muscle activation. That and we have two loops here, one in the spinal cord and one through the supraspinal cord. They generate muscle activation patterns and the biomechanics of movement. Now that also then goes down to a lower size scale, which we call the tissue mechanobiology loop, where the tissue structure is actually imposed on by the biomechanics. That causes tissue strain, which then triggers a tissue, the tissue biology governed by biochemistry as well. And it remodels the tissue structure based upon the loads that it's experiencing. Now that is the complete framework in which we study neuromusculoskeletal biomechanics. Now I'll delve into our tendon work very briefly because it'll give you some sort of insight why we've adopted this, this, um, this framework. So this was some experiments that we did um, in New Zealand, right? Rabbits, we took their Achilles tendons and put them into a bioreactor. And you can see them actually mounted in the bioreactor. This had a servo motor on it and was able to pull these tendons backwards and forwards at different strain rates. And we had uh, strain sizes. We had 0.1 Hertz strains for eight hours a day for six days a week. And we, at 0% strain, 3% strain, 6% strain, and 9% strain. And we looked at a number of different biomechanical as well as cell biological um, outcomes. One was collagen one gene expression. And what you see is that um, enhanced collagen one gene expression at 6% compared to zero, three, and 9% strain. Likewise, or similarly, you see collagen one Collagen-3 gene expression is upregulated at 9% strain. You see cell apoptosis, that's programmed cell death to actually kill the cells. And you see that upregulator at zero and 9% strain. And these are higher than the native. And 
you can see matrix metalloproteinase 12 expression upregulated at 3%. I'll tell you the, the rationale for these. Collagen 1 is the main um, protein that makes up tendons. It is what's the long fibers in tendons. Collagen 3 is actually scar material. It lays down very quickly. Cell apoptosis kills cells, so they don't start producing things. And matrix metalloproteinase 12 breaks down um, the fibers, the collagen one fibers in tendons. So what we're saying this is, is that 6% strain is where you get this positive adaptation to tendon. The other sides of these strains, 0, 3, and 9%, you see other types, their negative adaptation of the tendon. And this is telling us something about the mechanobiology of tissue, in this case, tendon. So let's look at this diagram, um, it's a schematic that we generated. So this is tendon strain on this axis and tendon damage on this axis. At low strains, you have disuse. Then you have micro ruptures as you start going up the tendon, um, the strain value. And then you go to larger ruptures and even further up until complete rupture. At the same time, you have tendon remodeling going on. That's what I depicted in those um, gene expressions. And so what you have is when around about this six to nine, or six, five, six, seven percent strain, you have anabolic creation of tissue or repair of tendinous tissue. On either side of that, you have catabolic breakdown, one from disuse and one from ex excessive use. And it can't keep up with that, with the loading and the strain and the, and the ruptures going on. Now that we call the sweet spot. And we also call it the Goldilocks zone. And this diagram is very typical of many different musculoskeletal tissues. And so that's our framework. And let's go back to the, um, the, the, the musculoskeletal conditions that we're looking at. An ACL injury is a complete rupture. So that's over here, right? So that's where you completely rupture it. However, more chronic conditions like osteoarthritis, which comes after um, ACL injury and repair, and Achilles tendinopathy, as you can see here, these could be catabolic either from disuse or overuse. We don't know yet. And that's one of the interesting things. And, but this is the framework in which you can actually study uh, musculoskeletal injuries and repair. Now, let's look at the this, this idea as well is that inappropriate loading and, and cartilage loss to focus on osteoarthritis. The interesting thing has been is that overloading has been for a long time thought to be cause of osteoarthritis. The medial compartment of the knee in walking concentrates loading on the medial compartment and cause, is the cause of osteoarthritis. However, these are all the other loading conditions that can give rise to exactly the same changes in cartilage. No loading, impact loading, and static loading. So the question is, it's not about overloading, it's about inappropriate loading or appropriate loading. And the question is, is how do you ascertain inappropriate loading or appropriate loading? So let's use a thought experiment for NEOA. And this is, um, this is something that Dave Saxby and I did uh, a couple of years ago. And we looked at this idea of what some of the neuromusculoskeletal biomechanic characteristics of knee away and what it, how it might affect um, actual knee loading. Basically, you get less moderate and high intensity physical activity in people with knee away or any knee condition. That means the articular surfaces are loaded less often. The knee motion and loading is actually affected in walking. The knee adduction moments are altered. That means you get an altered distribution between the medial and lateral surfaces of the, uh, of the knee joint. The knee flexion extension moments are altered, which means that you have different knee extension muscle forces applied to the articular surfaces. You walk slower because it hurts. The, uh, that means the articular surfaces are loaded for longer periods of time. The knee is more flexed, but has a reduced range of motion. That means there is a load concentrated over a smaller region of articular cartilage. And the, 
And in ACL injury, for example, or in reconstruction, the more the knee is more internally or externally rotated, which means a different region of the articular surface is loaded. And the other important thing is about the action of muscles. That's the neurological system. You get muscle atrophy in osteoarthritis and a lot of musculoskeletal conditions, which means muscle forces are smaller that are applied to the articular surfaces. You get arthrogenic muscle inhibition. That means the muscles are automatically turned off. And again, you get smaller muscle forces applied to the articular surface. And you also have higher levels of co-contraction. That means more muscle forces are applied to the articular surface. So the question is, if all these things are going on, what are the tissue act forces actually being experienced? And what we say is you need to integrate all those factors together. And this is where neuromusculoskeletal modeling can do that. Before I, I launch into this, um, this is a, a cavalcade of all the different people that uh, have made a major contribution to this neuromusculoskeletal modeling that we've um, undertaken, and it's still going on as we speak. So um, they've been, a lot of these people have been very, very instrumental in actually creating all this work that I'm going to present to you. It's built on OpenSim now. That's now tends to be the way that we do it in, in the biomechanics world, where you take traditional motion capture in a laboratory, you take 3D positions of markers, ground reaction forces and electromography, and you put it into open sim and you apply multi-rigid body computational models. First of all, you do a linear generic scaling in open sim, and then you do inverse kinematics and inverse dynamics They'll give you joint kinematics and joint kinetics. And these are the standard joint angles and joint moments and joint powers that you typically get out of, of a, a, a gait analysis now done anywhere in the world. But we can do more than that now because in the open scene environment, you have a static and even dynamic optimization in which you can synthesize muscle activation patterns and estimate muscle tendon forces. That means you can get inside the body. That's really important. So you're not remaining on the outside of the body, trying to infer the loading going on inside the body. And the, what we have championed is actually using um, EMG informed modeling, which we call calibrated EMG informed neuromusculoskeletal modeling, cinemas for short. And that's why we call it cinemas because it's much too much of a mouthful. So that's a publicly available um, software which plugs straight into OpenSim, which allows you to do calibrated EMG-informed neuromusculoskeletal modeling. Again, you synthesize muscle activation patterns and you predict muscle tendon forces. Then you can actually provide those forces as input to joint models or tissue models. This is our knee joint model. We have a tendon model and we have a hip joint model. These two are FEA. This is a rigid body model. And so from that, we can actually calculate tissue loading, stresses and strains. So and now we're getting to the point where we can look at what causes rupture or chronic change to tissue. And now, and I'll go at the very end, we're actually incorporating medical imaging and body scans into this now. So you can create personalized neuromusculoskeletal models into this pathway. Now, I have a saying, um, probably all my PhD students and research fellows have heard it ad nauseum, is that you don't understand anything un unless you can mathematically and me mechanistically model it. So that's a truism. The other truism, a model is only as good as the data it predicts. So you have to show that it's valid. So we were part, fortunately, of a the grand challenge, which was led by... Um, BJ Fregley and colleagues in, in the USA. And we, were, we actually represented EMG informed modeling. And in this study, we looked at um, the people that we tested had instrumented knee implants. So you can measure the medial and lateral um, forces inside the knee joint. We also measured all manner of other data, uh, motion capture, three dimensional motion analysis data we had CTs, we had drawings of the implants. So we could actually generate either scale generic models or subject specific models. 
And the question was, using open sim and cinemas, can we predict the measured articular loading? This is a scale generic. The measured is green, the modeled is red, and it becomes pretty obvious what happens when you do subject specific modeling is that you get very good estimates. So that's one point to take home. So we need to be always aware that we need valid models. The other one that we've started doing now, and we've only um, got one paper published and another submitted on this, this is using our Achilles tendon loading model. And this is a phenomenological model, which has been built on cadaveric data. And what we've done, this is leave, um, we've tuned the model, using the cadaveric data, and, and that's the experimental uh, forces. And here is the simulation model. And this is the R squared between the experimental and the simulated force. And you can see it goes from very low values to very high levels. And this is the Bland-Altman plot showing that there's no um, biased error there. So this is really an important part of the way forward. Instead of inferring ACL loading now, we can actually measure it in neuromusculoskeletal models. And the other big thing that we've now been able to do is do this in real time. So this is our real time modeling, again, using motion capture data from a motion capture laboratory. This is the medial compartment loading inside the knee joint. You can see open sim and cinemas working in real time, producing the muscle and medial compartment loading. Here's a blow up of that. And what was interesting about this one, again, showing the importance of the neural component, the person was walking along, you can see this force there, and this person can co-contract their flexors and extensors in the knee on demand. And when you see that, you can see the joint contact forces jump up. That's the medial compartment. And we tell him stop co-contracting, and you can see it go down again. What was very interesting in this, this one um, for this person is that his flexion extension moments decreased and his external knee adduction moments decreased. So if you were predicting it only from static optimization, you would predict that this was unloading the medial compartment, not increasing the load of the medial compartment. So neural matters. So we need to be sticking the neural into the musculoskeletal biomechanics. So let's launch into, with that background of the modeling that we've used over a long time, um, let's look at ACL injuries. Again, this is the big team of people that we've accumulated and have made a huge effort into the data and the results that you are going to see now. We've taken this from four different studies, types of studies. One is video analysis of the actual ACLs rupturing. You can see Michael Owen breaking his ACL in the 2005, was it? 2005 um, World Cup. You can analyze those. You can look at cadaveric studies and you can break the anterior cruciate ligament or you can see the external loads that load up the anterior cruciate ligament. You can do laboratory studies of different sporting tasks and that's has tend to be what we've mainly focused on. And then you can do in silico studies. And we've done a lot of this work as well, doing in silico work from the laboratory based studies. I'm going to look at these types of studies and see how they've led us to our final um, training programs. And our. so this was uh, when I did a dry run through with our English colleagues in Liverpool, I said, I'm going to show some photo, some videos of real football. Um, there's only one Australian football. Um, I know there's probably going to be a lot of whinging about that, but never mind, you'll all get over it. Anyway, unfortunately, this is a person breaking their anterior cruciate ligament. And it's a really interesting scenario because A, it's non-contact, which tends to be the majority of ACL injuries. In AFL, it tends to be around about 56% non-contact. 12% partial contact and 32% full contact. Those percentages get higher in other sports as well. So it's uh, it can be up to 80% in netball. Now of those non-contact injuries, it's 42% were sidesteps, 
20, 29% lands and 29 and 13% lands in a sidestep. A land is a mark in Australian football where you catch the ball above your leg and land on the leg. Um, and we analyze which way the knee gave way. And what, how it gives way is in valgus, it buckles inwards into a valgus posture. And you also get an internal rotation of the tibia uh, underneath the femur. And this has also been shown in other video analysis studies of injuries. When you go to cadaveric studies, I won't go into all of them, but these are the summary of them, is that you have sagittal plane loading and you have a knee extension moment, which tends to draw the tibia forward, especially during uh, more extended knee postures. Because of the posterior slope of the tibia, knee compression also drives the femur backwards or the tibia forward, again, causing anterior draw and both of these anterior draw load out the anterior cruciate ligament. Frontal plane loading, valgus moment has been particularly implemented um, in, in cadaver studies, as is internal rotation moments. And I have actually labeled that the perfect storm of loading for the anterior cruciate ligament, if you can measure them. And this is a, showing you how muscles stabilize knees. This is your knee, right? And this is uh, going into a valgus or, uh, sorry, varus posture or at knee adduction moment where you get this medial compartment loading. And this is the varus valgus loading of the ACL given um, the varus valgus moment of the knee. So the ACL gets loaded like that with increasing varus and valgus moment. Now the muscles can keep this joint closed and unload the anterior cruciate ligament from either varus or valgus moments. So that's a really important point to take home. Other muscles can also support the ACL in internal or external rotation as well. And this is by their moment arms. And what you see, and this is some of our earlier work, this is quite a long time ago, this is from my postdoc, um, you can see that the varus valgus moment arms decrease as you increase the knee flexion angles. So they're less able to support the knee if activated to do so. So, but you can see there's a whole lot of muscles that are varus and a whole lot of muscles that can support valgus. And the other really interesting thing when I combine our data with the data from um, Buford is that there are no muscles that can support valgus and internal rotation moments in the, in the, in the human body, which is a really interesting thing, given that valgus and internal rotation moments with anterior draw are the things that load up the anterior cruciate ligament. So let's head off into the laboratory. So this is a, a series of studies uh, that Marcus Lee did for his PhD, um, where we projected arrows, and this is an arrow planned uh, sidestep. So the arrow is actually shown before the person starts the approach run. They can either sidestep, that's a sidestep to six degrees, or do a crossover cut where the swing leg crosses over the stance leg and go in this direction. This is the unplanned arrow. It comes on last minute where the person's actually able to do, or last second that they're actually able to do a sidestep um, safely and complete it. Then we had two other scenarios. We had the one defender scenario projected on the screen and the person had to sidestep into this space. I should also say this is a three-dimensional projection. So a person had 3D glasses and they had to avoid this player. And then there was a two defender scenario where again, the person had to sidestep into the vacant space as shown here. And we flip these images as well. So they could go into a crossover cut or a sidestep. And we also changed the color of the jersey as well in the videos. So let's go into, I should just go back one step, is that the arrow plan uh, sidestep is the easiest to do because you've got most time to plan for it. The arrow unplanned was the most difficult to do because you had least amount of time to do it. 
how it turned out, the one defender scenario was second easiest to the, the um, arrow planned. And the two fender scenario was next most difficult, but not as difficult as the arrow one plan condition. So what we have now, the bottom three here, the flexion extension moments, virus valgus moments, and internal rotation moments, all this work was done before we actually had our neuromusculoskeletal models working to estimate the joint contact forces. So what you have here is a combination of data. This is the flexion extension moment, which would be drawing the tibia forward. So you have this extension moment in weight acceptance. You have this peak valgus moment in weight acceptance, and you have this peak in the internal rotation moment. You also have this peak in the, in the net joint contact forces. So this includes the muscles compressing the joint. So basically you, you have this perfect storm of loading for anterior cruciate rupture in sidestepping, but we don't rupture things all that often. The other thing that we found, this going from arrow planned to, sorry, arrow planned to arrow unplanned, one defender to two defender scenario, is that we found that, and you'll see this a little bit later on, is that in the arrow unplanned and two defender scenarios, the, the person had a lateral trunk flexion in that direction, right? Where arrow planned, it was much more upright. And we also see an increase from arrow plan to arrow unplanned in the peak valgus moments in, in the sidestep. And this is um, under, so this is, it was lowest in the arrow planned and up to 70% higher in the arrow unplanned position um, uh, situation. So again, you're showing you need time to plan to do a sidestep to prevent injury from occurring. The other thing that we saw much earlier, and this is going back quite a while, is that co-contraction was how people actually stabilize the joint. So this is pre-contact and weight acceptance. And this is the ground reaction force in a, in a sidestep of a stance phase of, sorry, the four different um, types of trials, a crossover cut, a straight run, a sidestep to 30 degrees, and a sidestep to 60 degrees. And you can see this U-shaped here is that the more difficult tasks like the crossover cut and the sidesteps had higher activation or co-contraction relative to a straight run. I can also say there was no difference in the flexion extension moments in these tasks. So this is actually driven for based upon stabilization. Again, our, our work was unable to look back then at the actual effects of, of muscle action on stabilizing the joint. So we relied upon activation patterns and the external loading to gauge what was a good or bad sidestep and how to change sidesteps to improve or reduce the risk of injury. So these were some of our bad sidestepping techniques that we identified. This was actually done by Tom Andriaki's group. All this was actually done by the UWA group. Um, and so lateral trunk flexion, external rotation of the trunk, a foot wide and a dorsiflexed ankle. So, and the person is sidestepping in this direction going from left to right. Is that right? Left to right or... So all those increase the peak valgus moments and or the peak inter internal rotation moments. So these are the postures that you should be trying to avoid when, you do, when you're doing a sidestep. So based upon all this information that we collected, and there's more, more studies that we, we did other than those, and we compiled these into training programs. And the first one was preventing Australian football injuries with exercise named PAFIX. And this is the team that we pulled together. This, this is a, a large study with about 1,600 players in it in, in Victoria and in, South, in Western Australia, in Australia. And we, we put this together 
He's had 40 community level AFL teams. These went high. They were just community players. They're in Perth and Ballarat as a 1600 players. What was interesting, we actually had a randomized placebo control trial and it was pretty much close to double blind. The trainers didn't know which study what, what was they were doing, nor did the people who were being trained. But we had two training interventions. One is the PAFIX injury uh, prevention program. That was based upon our laboratory studies, ours and others. And it also it addressed ACL injuries, but it also addressed ankle injuries as well. And we had the placebo training program. It was progressive difficulty. It started pre-season and it continued throughout the playing season. Question is, did it reduce knee injuries? The important point I want to throw in here was that this was a team of people who pulled this together of different types because when you actually implement large training programs in the community, you need a range of different people. And so you can see all the different people and all the different, how I categorise all these different people. That's some of their, their faces there. But you can see you go from engineers like me, biomechanists, sports scientists, sports trainers, sports behaviourists and sports epidemiologists. We had to put all those people together to actually um, develop this training program and roll it out. This is the results which we published in 2015. As you can see, it worked. And aligned with a lot of other studies which have shown the same thing is that there was around about a 50% exposure adjusted rate of in-game knee injuries, the, the PAFIX versus placebo. And that's what we're finding now is a lot of these training programs can at least reduce ACL injuries and knee injuries by at least 50%. So um, that's good to know, but now we actually have to implement these things more widely. And we have a new version of this called Footy First, um, and that's being implemented in community Australian football. Now, this is the newest stuff, and we've used some work from University of Melbourne where they've done this single lead land and sidestep task. And using a neuromusculoskeletal model, which estimated the ACE, uh, the anterior cruciate ligament loading. We looked at what the ACL loading was in this task. What you find is the ACL loading is really quite high. That's up to a thousand newtons. Interestingly enough, the major loading was the sagittal plane loading platform, which is shooting all our uh, propositions that we've written in all our papers that it was due to frontal plane and transverse plane loading. So you can see the majority of that was actually driven by the sagittal plane loading. So that's anterior draw by the knee extension moments and knee compression by the flexors and extensors acting together. So here it is in a little bit more detail. You can see um, where are the ACL loading, there it is there from the sagittal plane. Look at the size of the scale there, it's 2000 newtons and 3000 newtons, this is sagittal plane knee loading. And you've got frontal plane loading again, but it's much smaller and much smaller from the transverse plane loading. Now, it doesn't mean that frontal plane and transverse plane are not important for ACL rupture because none of these people ruptured their A2 cruciate ligaments. But this is telling you where the major loading is coming from. And you can really only ascertain that using these neuromusculoskeletal models. Now, the question is, can we do this in the field in real time? I'll leave that floating. I'll look at our ACL ligament injury and reconstruction. Again, we've got a large team which contributed to this. Again, just to refresh you, like tendons, cartilage has a sweet spot between 20 and 30% strain where you stimulate regrowth. What we looked at, is we had people who are ACL reconstructed with a quadrupled autologous semitendinosus gracilis graft using keyhole therapy uh, surgery. We had 104 ACL controls and 60 controls in one study. And another study, we had 20 ACL reconstructed. And these people, we had much higher levels of imaging. Everyone had motion capture. And we tested some of the, uh, these people 
at four to five years post reconstruction. This is one of the, this is from the 20 ACL study. And as you can see here, this is the surgery limb and the non-surgical limb. You can see the wasting of the, of the gracilis and semitendinosus compared to the other side. There was a 40% decrease in volume and cross-sectional area. <coughs> Excuse me. And there was a um, decreased inflection strength and internal rotation strength and altered activation patterns. So the question we asked, do people who've had an ACL reconstruction have higher or lower levels of articular loading versus age match controls in walking, running and sidestepping? So what we have here, we have the medial compartment loading along that row. This row here, we have the lateral compartment loading and this row, we have the total compartment loading. Down here is walking, running, and sidestepping. The red is the controls, and the blue, the anterior cruciate ligament, and the green is, uh, is implant data, measured implant data, not from, this da not from this data set, but this was to, to see that we're in the right ballpark. And as you can see, we were. The take home message is, is that ACL reconstructed patients at two to three years after surgery have lower medial compartment and total loading across all gates, not larger. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is basically saying is that, well, overloading may not be the problem here. So we've looked at this a little bit further and we've looked at people, we looked at bone marrow lesions lesions and cartilage defects and scored them. And this is isolated ACL reconstruction and this is ACL reconstruction plus a, a meniscal injury. This is if increased joint contact forces leads to lowered cartilage defects and lower bone marrow lesions. This is the odds ratio. If you have an odds ratio greater than one, it means that higher joint contact forces would cause the, these cartilage defects. What we found was the medial tibiofemoral joint, both cartilage defects and large barrow marrow lesions were, had an odds ratio of 0.86, or lower than one significantly, if you had higher joint contact forces. For the ACLR plus meniscal injury, there was no such effect. In other words, the meniscal injury actually affects the outcomes and the change in tissue. And this is some studies from our one of my colleagues and a mentor, Tom Buchanan and crew at University of Delaware, again supporting this idea that underloading is a cause of osteoarthritis in an ACL reconstructed population. This is the medial... Uh, they selected a group of patients, non-OA and OA, after ACL reconstruction. This is six months after the reconstruction, and this is two years after the reconstruction. You can see the non-OA patients at five years out had higher joint contact forces than the OA patients who recorded osteoarthritis, that's radiographic osteoarthritis, five years after the surgery. So again, you're seeing when possibility of lower loading, disuse being a precursor to the development of osteoarthritis in ACL reconstructed. With the caveat there is if you've got a meniscal damage, that probably doesn't actually ring true. So you now have to treat your ACL reconstructed differently. So it means that uh, partial meniscectomy. Where are these people on this remodeling curve? We've got ACL reconstructed, partial meniscectomy, and ACL reconstructed. We think ACL reconstructed have disuse, where meniscal injury and partial meniscectomy have overuse or too much loading because the meniscus actually concentrates loading in the medial compartment of the knee. We're into the home straight. Achilles tendon and escaping the laboratory. And I said, that's where we get to. And this is our, our team of people that have been involved in this over the 
probably the last five years. Just to refresh you, is that the sweet spot for tendon strain is 6%. So to do that, we've actually created subject-specific final analysis models of, of Achilles tendons. We do scanning using a 3D freehand um, ultrasound. You can see the markers there, which is you can record that um, in a motion capture system. You can reconstruct these tendons in the loaded and unloaded state. So at rest is gray, 70% in maximum voluntary contraction. And then we create a finite element model from these here because we know the loading because we measured it here with a load cell. We know the joint angle and we know the loading. So we know the loaded and unloaded forces and we also know the loaded and unloaded three-dimensional shape. So we can fit the material properties to this fine element model. And this is a, a random set of PhD students in the laboratory that we used uh, to do this study. The first thing that you take note is this is the free Achilles tendon. You can see there's very different sizes and shapes of Achilles tendons. Secondly, you can see the strain is different depending on excuse me, on the, on the actual tendon. And that's another important thing to take home again, reiterating this concept that um, personalised models and personalisation of sports medicine is important. So we need to have personalised models. The other thing that we know is subtendons actually are three, well, the Achilles is three subtendons that twist around about anywhere between zero and 60 degrees. So we modeled it. So we gave these fibers some twists. And then we looked at, at this is from a cadaveric study, and then we looked at the differences in strains, predicted strains. Again, there's a sweet spot near amount of twist is that 30 degrees tends to have the lowest um, strains and a more equal strain distribution rather than the zero and a 60 degree twist. So again, you're seeing that we need to incorporate some of these subject specific parameters of the Achilles into our models. So the next really big thing is that, and I won't go into the details, is because we can, running finding out models is a very time consuming process. So what we do, we can run all these finding out models with a range of different external loads on them. And we can build up a database of forces and three-dimensional strains. And then we use an AI method to actually to go from forces to strains. And once you've got an AI method, you can actually run those in real time. So what we've done, we've combined this surrogate, we've combined this surrogate model of a final model of Achilles tendon and put it into a, a real-time neuromusculoskeletal model. And you get real-time stress strain in the Achilles tendon. And what's even cooler is that it can run on an iPhone. So this is actually pointing to the future. This is, this is happening right now. So this is really possible. And I think that's really what I want to take home message from this is the future is within our hands now. We've just got to pursue it. But we're still stuck in the laboratory. So how do we get out of the lab? And that's a really huge thing. So first of all, the data that we need to replicate is what we do in a laboratory. We need kinematic data. We need the ground reaction forces and you need electromyography. That's essentially what we need to run our models. So we've uh, done some work with Naraxon and we've created something called Smarty Pants. That's my name, the father of dad jokes. And essentially what we have, we have fabric electrodes in Smarty Pants over the muscles um, in, the, in uh, both the shank and the thigh. We've also 3D printed little containers for the um, the... IMUs and we just slot them in. 
and then we transmit this all back to Naraxon. And we've now integrated this into OpenSim. So this is actually possible to do real-time motion capture and EMG using Smarty Pants in a Naraxon system that runs into OpenSim. So we're partway there. But what we don't have are ground reaction forces or estimates of joint moments from this. So we enter the UWA crew again. So this is colleagues at UWA, um, Bill Johnson and Jackie um, Alderson led this. And it was from all our data that we had collected over the many years of, of people walking, running and sidestepping. We had millions and millions of trials. That's big data. So we said, can we actually mine this? So what we have, we have measured ground reaction forces and model joint moments through inverse dynamics. We said, what's the minimum number of markers that we can predict these things? So we would C7 marker, sacral marker, and three markers each on the feet. If you can think about this, this is an IMU, an IMU, an IMU, and an IMU, four IMUs. So, first, so what we did, we used convolution neural network, which is first trained on identifying faces and types of faces in a crowd. That was trained on about 50,000. A convolution neural network actually says you can step down in size the number of data every time you apply the neural network. So first of all, <coughs> excuse me, we applied it to ground reaction forces about 4,000 trials, then we, trial, then we trained it again to predict joint moments. And, these were, and then we took 25% um, of those out, re retained those for um, testing and used 75% of training of the models, the data. That is, these are the results, they've been published. And this is the ground reaction forces. Um, I can't tell which ones are the right ones, which ones are measured, which ones are not, um, which ones predicted. And these are the joint moments. Again, I can't tell. They're within the experimental error. The next stage, and we've just, it's just come out this paper now. And so watch for it. It's actually, we've synthesized wearable sensor data from the motion capture data. So we accept synthesized accelerations or accelerometers train the model, and then we've used some accelerometer data from real people with ground reaction forces in a, in a laboratory, and we've found that you can predict ground reaction forces using those um, convolution neural networks. So really what I'm saying, this is not very far off. We can put all this data together into a wearable system with, with wearable devices and with neuromusculoskeletal models that are help assisted by AI methods. So this is our big picture at the moment, and this is what we're aiming for. And we've actually got a long way along this pathway. We take body scans of people. We find out where the IMUs are on the person. We get MRIs, we get cadaveric data and literature data. We use AI methods to generate these different subject specific models. And then we go, we have this final subject specific model. So this is a hull of this person here. And from the waist down, this is completely subject specific. And we have subject specific hip joints and subject specific Achilles tendon. We're working on subject specific, actually we do have our subject specific rigid body knee models as well. That's them just there. That's where it is. So once that model's created, the idea is run it with wearable motion capture data to give you real-time neuromusculoskeletal biomechanics and real-time tissue loading, hopefully, and as you can see, on a mobile phone. And if we can do that on a mobile phone in real time, then that's, that's it. So that's the future of infield sports biomechanics, and I think. And so I've led you where we've been in biomechanics is that we looked at external loading and muscle activation patterns, and it served us well. 
But now I think we have to move forward to these new technologies and the time is right to move sports biomechanics into the future. I just want to say um, thank you um, again um, to, it's not me, it's, uh, I'm a Christian and I think I've been given these tasks and it's, it's really, God, it's allowed me to do all this stuff um, and I've been, been blessed with all the amazing uh, PhD students, research fellows and mentors that I've had along through the years and it's those people who are the real stars here, um, they, they really are the stars and, the, and these guys are the, are, are the future. And I thank you again. David, thank you for an inspirational talk. You've obviously shown what I talked about before is that you clearly create theoretical models and you create a theory behind where you can take research in biomechanics. And from that, you come up with functional applications. Um, let me just ask a quick question, which is really, it, it's probably at the base of what most people would like to know in their day-to-day -day existences. If you look at, let's say, ACL injuries to start with, what would your advice be to athletes? And if you can give the answer in two parts, you may not need to, but if you'd wish to, one to say professional athletes, and one to your recreational athletes, what would you actually say to them in preparing their body to protect them from ACL injuries? Good question. And that's another four hour talk. Um, have we got time? <laughs> um, the main things is that we've actually summarized a lot of the things that we should be aiming for. And Obviously, the thing that we're aiming for is to reduce loading on the anterior cruciate ligament. That's our ultimate goal in everything that we're trying to do. Um, there are many training methods that we've shown actually do work in reducing the varus valgus loading on the knee joint, particularly valgus, reducing the internal rotation moments. And they are what you saw, if we can go back in, in these slides, but they're there, they're actually um, bringing the foot to the midline is closer to the midline when you sidestep, certainly reduces the knee, adduction, uh, knee valgus moments or, or abduction moments. It's, if you turn towards the sidestep direction, not away from the sidestep direction, you lower the external loading, the valgus and internal rotation moments. If you lean into that direction and turn into the sidestep direction, you're certainly loading the anterior, um, reducing load on the anterior cruciate ligaments. So that's the type of training drills that you should be learning to do. Um, the counter argument to that, and I, I get this a lot, is that but when you do a sidestep like that, aren't you telling your opposition player that you're going to sidestep in a certain direction? The interesting thing is, <clears throat> excuse me, is that most coaches will tell you to lean in the opposite direction to which you're going to do a sidestep and rotate your body away from the direction that you're going to do a sidestep. They also tell you to plant your foot wide and all those things will actually, as far as we know, increase load on the anterior cruciate ligament. But because everyone's doing it, it's actually a warning sign saying, I'm going to do a sidestep that way. So I think those types of, um, um, what do you call it, uh, postures and to actually perform a sidestep uh, are absolutely crucial. It doesn't matter if you're a, um, an elite player or not an elite player. The other one I think is that you really need to learn how to balance um, through all our uh, training programs, pre and post, we found that if you learn how to balance, uh, balance your upper body, it's really quite crucial. Well, yeah, We've one, done training. One thing that's it's very interesting, isn't it, is that <clears throat> balance seems to be crucial to so many of the lower limb yep. injuries. And I've always Absolutely. been amazed at the number of professional athletes that have a very poor balance. 
Absolutely. It's it's absolutely crucial because um, that load that gets onto the knee joint is because the head, head, arms and trunk, this big lump of meat sitting on top of your knees wobbles around. And if it's not well controlled, it actually goes under large accelerations. Those large accelerations actually cause the loading. So that's one thing about balance. The other thing about balance is that it probably teaches you how to stabilize the knee joint because uh, strength training, and some of our studies have shown this, that strength training reduces the co-contraction of the knee muscles in, in running and sidestepping, which is counter to what you actually want. You actually want co-contraction during weight acceptance and just prior to weight acceptance in a land, both a sidestep and a landing from a, from a drop land or a, or a mark, you need to stabilize the knee because what our work is showing, especially now when we're running the models on looking at ACL loading and looking at the muscles contribution to the ACL loading, it is quite obvious that the muscles are well stabilizing the knee in varus valgus directions and internal rotation directions. So those external loading um, are not getting through to the, to the cruciate ligament and causing injury. So it's really telling us that we need to focus on those stabilization activation patterns, which I think is actually learned through balance training, um, you know, wobble boards and, and, and alike, all these other types of, of balance um, training programs that, that coaches develop all the time. Um, walking around on soft sand, walking around on rocks, climbing trees. When you're a young person, I would say, um, that's what you need to do. You, a balance is like every system. It's a learnt, it's a learnt thing, and that you need to train it. And I agree with your statement. I, I remember at UWA we had some footballers through, and you were there too, Bruce. They couldn't stand on one leg if their life depended upon it. Um, you really do need that that balance. And some of our training programs, we've actually put in very rudimentary balance training to start people out. So I think it's absolutely crucial for ACL injuries and probably a lot of joint injuries in the lower limb. David, let me ask you a question. I'll read this out because it's come from one of the listeners. Uh, the 6% tendon loading is going to need different levels of activity for different people. Any advice on how to guess the required level of intensity for different individuals such as between a competitive athlete and an in inactive person. Good grief. Was that one of our PhD students? Um, They've been waiting to ask you these nasty questions for quite a while. Actually, we're, I'm, we're processing the data right now on answering that question. Um, we ran a study with the Australian Institute of Sport where we had 20-odd um, elite athletes, where, which were... Um, elite runners, and also, um, oh, geez, I can't not call them lard balls, um, uh, <laughs> but couch potatoes, um, sedentary individuals, there we go. Um, and we, we measured, we did the Achilles tendon strength, um, um, measures using the 3D freehand ultrasound. We did MRIs on the, on the Achilles tendons and the lower limb muscles. We also had every single person do running, sidestep, landing, plus also a standard training programs like calf lowers, calf raises, and calf lowers with, with weighted vests. The idea was to try and work out what is the strain in these different tissues for sedentary individuals and elite athletes and what task actually produce those around about that 6%. We're probably going between four and 7% strains. That's, um, the short answer is I don't know at the moment, but um, it's actually been, I actually had a meeting with a PhD student today and it's progressing. So probably in a couple of months time, we'll be able to tell you. <laughs>
So David, I'm just going to jump in there because it looks like David, we might have lost my, our boost is uh, back. My Zoom is now disappearing in and out. I, I'm not sure if the ISPS has only paid for a given amount of time on the web or what. Um, I think it's more my problem. So uh, can I just say I've really enjoyed your talk. Again, you've inspired people. We're inspiring the internet to work. It looks like we might have lost Bruce, unfortunately. Um, I'll just perhaps wrap up on Bruce's behalf, David. I think an absolutely fascinating lecture, which we've had plenty of people enjoying from around the world by the looks of it. So thank you ever so much for your time and for agreeing to do this. I know it's a shame we've not been able to enjoy your company in Liverpool this year, but um, there's been plenty of questions come in as well, which Bruce um, didn't get to, but I'm sure um, you won't mind if people direct those to you directly at some point after the No, that'd be abs absolutely perfect. Yep. Fantastic. So thanks again for an absolutely fascinating um, Dyson lecture and hopefully plenty of us will get to meet you in, in Canberra next year if the conference goes ahead. Um, hopefully next year. Looking forward to it. I wish everyone's uh, safe times in these strange times. Everyone take care.